quarter wave error in primary spherical aberration will result in 20% reduction in the illuminance at the Gaussian focus. The Gaussian focus essentially being the areas. That's a, a little important recognition to understand that even when Raleigh was doing his experiments in physics, he understood that at a quarter wave, there's going to be a reduction of 20% of light approximately from the airy disk into the rings. And further, that this was right at the threshold where we would be able to notice some degradation. So it was a judgment that this is a good standard. It has proven the test of time, and is generally pretty good. So what's meant by quarter wave at the wave front? Light rays come in, and then you can think of them as these little purples of the emitting ray photons, and a wave front is parallel to the rays of light. And, oops, I used a PowerPoint where you hit the space bar. When light comes converging into a focus, then you have, spher then you have spherical wave fronts uh, coming together at the focus. So if you can imagine two shells a quarter of a wavelength apart, then you're satisfying the Raleigh criteria. If the primary spherical aberration, remember we have a smooth mirror, we're looking at primary spherical aberration, if it differs, uh, and in this case, this is the undercorrected situation, so the rays at the outside of the mirror, otherwise known as the marginal rays, are ahead of the rays coming from the center of the mirror. But the, but the correction error is within a quarter of a wave. Now there's also the overcorrected condition where the marginal rays are behind the center rays, um, and that's still within the quarter wave. And that's essentially the intent of what's meant by a quarter wave criteria. It's not that anything goes between quarter wave criteria. Whether or not light actually hits the target is a function of the slope of this wave front. And if it gets too wiggly between the quarter wave, you're still going to miss your target. So the Dangeon and Coder criteria is a little different. Andre Dangeon and Andre Coder who both worked at the Paris Observatory, and Coder, by the way, happened to have been the teacher for Jean Texero, who wrote the book, How to Make a Telescope, which we'll refer to later. It's a, become a very standard book for telescope making. But their criteria has two parts to it. Sorry that it's numbered one and three. I guess that's what these programs do and have a thing. But the first one says, the geometric image of least confusion in the plane of focus should not exceed the size of the theory, theoretical area disk. And three, the maximum wavefront error must not have a quarter of a wavelength of light, and the defect should be much less than this. These are the first words that seem to show up some kind of a, a local defect that can be a quarter of a wave, provided that you meet condition one of the Dungeon encoder criteria. So, what do I mean by that? I have a system here that's affected by spherical aberration, because I have a spherical mirror. The light is coming from the right. Uh, which you don't see, but it hits the optical system, comes to uh, what would be a focus at the left, but because it's a sphere, the marginal rays are hitting, focusing closer than the praxial rays, and I'm just going to blow up this little section right here so you can see it magnified. <laughs> okay, there. Uh, there we go. And this is where the marginal rays focus and the praxial rays focus. This area here is the longitudinal aberration, and somewhere in between that, the bundle of light comes to a, its narrowest point, and that's called the circle of least confusion. And um, as you parabolize your mirror, as you go through your series of ellipses to a parabola, this longitudinal aberration will get shorter, and the circle of least confusion will get smaller, and eventually the circle of least confusion will fit inside the area disk. And this is essentially where the term diffraction limited comes from because now you have corrected your mirror to the point where the light rays are all going to focus within this, uh, this disk size that's bound by physical optics. So the quarter wave standard, just to put this in a little bit of perspective for you, this is a table that came out of a manual for telescope makers by Karen and Jean-Marc Leclerc on page 70. It's a recent publication from Wilma Bell. This table is published elsewhere also, but what it shows is how much light is in the area disk for various wave ratings of mirror. Remember, we're talking wave front error. We're talking spherical aberration. So with perfect optics, 84% is in the area disk. At a 16th of a wave, 83%. At an 8th of a wave, 80%. You notice between a hundredth of a wave or a millionth of a wave to an eighth of a wave, it's all clustered around 80%. And when you get to a quarter of a wave, you drop down to 68%. And half a wave, you drop down to 40%. Work that time. 
I plotted this for you just to hope to visualize it because this is a pretty interesting curve. This is a half wave. Wave rating is at the bottom half wave, quarter wave, eighth wave, tenth wave, sixteenth wave. And you can see that between a half a wave and an eighth of a wave, you have a straight line and it's reasonably steep so that any change in wave rating is going to give you a pretty perceptible change in the amount of light that's in the air at this. Once you get to an eighth of a wave, that curve starts to lean over, flatten out, and you enter the era, area of um, area of diminishing returns. This sixteenth of a wave limit was established by another French physicist or astronomer by the name of Francon. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm not really French, but his determination after a lot of experiments and work and so on was that at a sixteenth of a wave with 83% of the light in the area disk, it is just not humanly possible to tell the difference between 83% in the area disk and 84. So that he said any figuring beyond a sixteenth of a wave is essentially useless. I've drawn a magnification of the top part of the curve to show that I'll actually probably, for all practical purposes, for us amateurs building backyard telescopes, that you can probably back down here to a tenth of a wave, and at a tenth of a wave, 81% of your light is in the area disk. And I would bet there's nobody in this room if they had two telescopes side by side that could tell me the difference between 81.6% 81 and 83% light in the area disk that you saw. Now, I do want to mention that I am talking about a full telescope system here, but most of the spherical aberration is driven by the figure of our primary, but there are other contributors to it. But I do want to just make sure I point out this is a fundamental output of your telescope, everything going wrong, going along. Conclusion here, and this is what I think is important for all of you making telescopes, is to realize that a quarter of a wave mirror is a pretty respectable standard. I forgot to mention that all the schmidt cast telescopes out there with 33% obstruction, the amount of light taken from the area disk and put into the rings with a 33% obstruction is about equivalent to a quarter of a wave. So a schmidt cast telescope is no better than a quarter wave system, I don't care how good you make the optics. And you've all seen these wonderful detailed pictures in Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine and how wonderful and detailed sharp pictures of Saturn and Jupiter and Mars are. So a quarter wave is really a very respectable standard if you can achieve that. And a tenth of a wave, you just don't need to think about anything more than that. So if you're making mirrors, I just wanted to point that out so that you're not driving yourself to figure a 25th of a wave mirror or something. Again, talking wave front not necessarily surface. A mirror, just let me interject this at this point, there's usually a two-fold, uh, you know, when a light comes forward, hits a mirror, and then reflects away, the angle is, is doubled. So the surface accuracy on a mirror has to be half what the wave from there is. So if you want a one-quarter wave from there, that's a one-eighth surface error. But all of the measurements you take are optical, so it's the wavefront error that we're really interested in here, but I do just want to point out. Okay, very nice. How do we satisfy these criteria? That's what I want to talk about here more today. I'm going to talk about three methods. The first is the classic method. Second, I'm going to walk you through Tectoro's explanation. And then I'm going to, to show you the next step that Mills LaCroix took after Tectoro to make things even easier and better for you. This first step that was first described by Frank Wright, ATM, a scientific American in 1933. This method is, the, what they were trying to do was put a tolerance on your knife edge readings. So that when you do it, you know that you have to move your knife edge, and those knife edge positions are defined by R squared over R. I'm not going to hit that exactly. What is my tolerance about that? That method was then carried forward a little later by Alan Thompson in his book, uh, How to Make a Telescope, or, or Making Your Own Telescope, and Neil Howard in Telescope Making, and Sam Brown in All About Telescope. So this is a nice method for if you are just getting started, you don't know all of ray trace optics, and you're looking for a fairly straightforward arithmetic method to come up with a tolerance. And I want to say and emphasize right from the beginning that this particular method starts with a scientific principle, and they leave the scientific principle and then says, experience says, I can do that. Experience is a good teacher, but if you start with a scientific principle which isn't complete, you then have to go on and say, experience says, I can do this. And that's what they did, and that's what they say in the book. They base their thing on, or based on the quarter wave standard, not the then shown corner criteria, and we're trying to make a, a 
uh, a mirror that meets the quarter wave standard and based on material removal. And it's really just about this simple. If I consider a sphere, I know that's an undercorrected parabola. So I'm going to polish my parabola, so I'm going, to, I'm going to flatten the edges so that the marginal rays focus a little longer. And I know that there's a relationship, right, the sphere and the parabola touching at the, at the center, that the difference between the parabola and the sphere at any radius is expressed by y to the fourth divided by eight times r cubed. That's the most complicated math this gets. So you solve for this difference at the edge of the mirror. So for 8 inch f7, I have a radius of 4. My radius of curvature is 112. So my difference in material, this is material to the sphere, uh, the material in your mirror, is going to be, by the time you calculate that, about 22 millionths of an inch. That happens to be one wavelength of light, but that's just coincidence if you read about it in the books. Now I know that I need to get my, I'm looking for a quarter wave standard, so I'm looking to get my sphere to within a quarter of a wave of my parabola. Now, here's where the theory starts to break down and experience kicks in. They say, well, I know that to a sphere, to a, uh, at, a, at the material surface, I need an eighth wave, not a quarter wave. But they found that if they actually brought that numerically to an eighth of a wave, it was way too tight of a tolerance and unnecessary. So they said, experience says we can double it. So you're essentially back to a quarter wave material removal here, and it happens to provide a boundary that does in fact actually work, even though it doesn't totally oops, follow through scientifically. Did I get a little too far? What am I doing? Why is the radius, uh, in this case, the radius of your mirror, Okay. Again, I want to emphasize that we're starting with a smooth sphere. This is a knife edge cut off of a sphere. It's nulled, there are no holes, no zones, no turned edge. I've got a diffraction ring around there saying my edge is good and so on. If I use raunchy lines, they're absolutely straight and parallel. And I'm pushing, it doesn't, I'm not starting out with something that looks like this. I fix all of that. And then I um, parabolize it until I get a nice, smooth appearing surface and a nice, gradual blood cell look. That's the center mark, so I can uh, do my collimation. So again, just to remember, we're taking from the sphere and we're pushing it to a parabola and we can go a certain amount. It turns out, in this particular case, since this distance is 22 millionths of an inch, which is a wavelength of light, and a quarter of a wavelength is five and a half millionths, that I can go within 25% of my ideal. So, I've talked about the quarter wave, eighth wave argument, and so the R squared over R for 8 inch F7 at the 95% zone is 0.1289. I have a tolerance of plus or minus 25% in this example, so at the edge zone, my knife edge, I, if I hit that ideal, that's great, but anywhere between 97 thousandths and 161 will give me a, a good mirror. And any zone between zero and the edge zone, I prorate by the same amount. This is a table, and this is what you get. This is the radius of your various zones, the 70% zone, the 95% zone, the zero zone. This is your R squared over R, which is your ideal knife edge position. This is your min, this is your max. Those limits do work. I hope to show you that before I'm done. What you get is a tolerance envelope that looks like this. And those of you that may be more familiar with more current methods realize that that's not exactly the way it works in physics. But because of that, it allowed them to double what's out here because this collapses to zero down here. The tolerance just happens to work. So it's a very simple method without having to know complicated ray trace. That's what Howard's mirror looks like. You would be best off if you could try to figure it so that your points are even and, and, and pure and you're just over or under corrected by a certain amount. You'll end up with a very good mirror. It's not really best suited for anything goes between the boundaries criteria. So if you have a rather long focal length mirror, you can get a nice, smooth, regular sphere with the holes and zones and push it to a parabola. And then it's uh, uh, then you can get an 